Jason Taylor has been a college defensive line coach for one year. He's already a top five recruiter in the entire country. You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricanes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Alex Dono. I'm a University of Miami alumnus, longtime South Florida sports radio vet and contributor to allhurricanes.com. Thank you to the everydayers for making Locked On Canes your first listen and your first watch. We are free on your favorite podcast platform. We're free on YouTube, and we're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. It's official now. Miami Hurricanes have the top defensive line class in the country, class of 2024. This comes a year after having one of the top offensive line classes in America in 2023. Guys, um, if you want to be sustainable, if you want to build a sustainable powerhouse program the way that Georgia has done, the way Alabama had done for many years, you look at how good Michigan was at the line of scrimmage this past year, and that was something Harbaugh had been building there for a long time. Building it from the inside out, right? Being two, three, four deep with killers on the defensive line and on the offensive line, which is obviously another area of strength for Miami. That's a great starting point, right? Skill positions, everything gets built out from that point. Miami also went out and got the most sought after quarterback in the transfer portal, but building it at the line of scrimmage is so important. So now that 24 seven sports has finished all of their updates for the class of 2024, not only does Miami have the top defensive line class in the country, Jason Taylor, co-defensive line coach was the top recruiter in the ACC and the number four recruiter in all of America. And I'm not forgetting about Big Joe Salavea either because Big Joe was instrumental, especially for guys like Justin Scott, who's actually the top rated player in that defensive line class and Artavius Jones. We've told many of the stories here on the podcast about how Big Joe and Artavius were able to click, but the Hall of Famer, JT, He's brought Miami's defensive line recruiting to another freaking level. Do you remember back, I don't know, around September, Miami had missed out on some D-line guys. Things were looking grim for a while. And the rival fan bases, the Gator fans, the Seminole fans, they started to pipe up and they were trolling us saying, this Jason Taylor, he can't recruit. How overrated is this guy? Miami's defensive line class is going to be an embarrassment. Well, December rolls around. The trolls got awfully quiet. Miami is the only team in the country who pulled in five defensive linemen ranked in the top 247, the top 247 players at 247 Sports. Miami has four defensive linemen in the top 150. That's tied for most in America. Justin Scott ranked number 11 overall. That's overall players, not just defensive linemen. Number 11 rated overall player. Marquise Lightfoot, number 34 overall. Armando Blunt, number 39, Booker Pickett Jr., who we still think is underrated at number 142 overall. By the way, folks, if you missed our conversation yesterday with Booker Pickett Sr., father of Booker Jr., it was an all-timer. That was, uh, and I'm not even giving myself credit here because Booker was awesome. The truth teller was really good. He was part of that conversation as well. Truth teller uh, is the one who knows Booker and was able to help us get him on the show uh, if you missed our episode with Booker Pickett Sr., it was fantastic. And he talked about how relentless Mario Cristobal and Jason Taylor were in the recruitment of his son. And he said it, that Miami recruiting machine is even it's even better than fans realize and even bigger than fans talk about when it comes to the level of communication, text messages, phone calls, the way they pull out all the stops with official and unofficial visits. Uh, I'm really, really happy with the way Miami is recruiting, and Jason Taylor has become a huge part of that. So when, when I talk about where some of these defensive linemen rank according to 24-7, a couple of these guys are ranked higher on other recruiting services. Armando Blunt, for example, he's not considered a five-star by 24-7, but he is a five-star on both on three and on rivals, and he's a composite five-star. And remember, something about Armando Blunt, this young man from Miami Central, he's leaving high school a year early 
and he's an early enrollee at Miami. He's already six foot three, uh, six foot three and a half, actually, 250 pounds at 16 years old. <laughs> he's one of the top defensive linemen in the country. He's essentially arrived at Miami a year and a half before most people start college, which is crazy. And I think Armando Blunt is going to develop very quickly at Miami. Marquise Lightfoot, he's a four-star on 24-7, but he is a five-star on Rivals. Rivals recently bumped Lightfoot up to a five-star, and he certainly played like a five-star in the All-American Bowl uh, earlier on this month. Booker Pickett Jr., he's got four stars now from every recruiting service, but he played like a five-star going up against blue chippers at both the Under Armour game and the Polynesian Bowl. Pickett combined for four sacks, two forced fumbles, an interception in those games. He looked unblockable. And not to mention Booker Pickett in high school in Tampa, he was putting up Reuben Bain type sack numbers. I, I've referred to him as kind of the Tampa version of Reuben Bain. He's not as big, uh, but I think he's going to be a great one at Miami. So Jason Taylor, top ranked recruiter in the ACC, fourth in the entire country. Hell of a job. First season as defensive line coach. That's what you call impact. Okay. Now, as far as making an impact, because I, I always get this question from people with this star-studded defensive line class coming in, um, is there going to be a Reuben Bain in this year's class? Now, Miami got some good ones. I'm not forgetting about, you know, Jaden Wayne. Like, Miami had some good ones in the class last year at defensive end. Uh, but as for the guy who made the big-time first-year impact, that was Hurricane Bain last year. Is there going to be another Hurricane Bain this year? The guy who would I, I would expect to have the biggest first-year impact would be Justin Scott. Because honestly, guys, if you look at his physical tools, it's been decades since Miami's pulled in a D-tackle with the freakish abilities. I'm not saying we haven't pulled in some good D-tackles over the years, but when it comes to the well-rounded freakish abilities, this guy is a unicorn, 310 pounds with his type of athleticism. Great basketball player as well. Moves more like a 210-pounder. Uh, the only thing that may hold Justin Scott back, I guess, a little bit is the fact that he's not enrolling early, but he's such a freak. It's going to be hard to keep this guy off the field. I'm not sleeping on Marquise Lightfoot or Booker Pickett either. I mean, Artavius Jones is already a man child. Uh, Armando Blunt, he's so young. So I don't know if like the fact that he's 16 right now, if he needs a little longer to develop, but I think there's numerous candidates, right? I mean, listen, there's only one Reuben Bain. I'm not trying to directly compare any of these guys to Hurricane Bain, but if you're looking at guys who could make an immediate impact, I would say Justin Scott would be my top candidate, but there are others out there who are possibilities to be great. And this is how you build championship teams. You stack classes, top classes on the offensive and defensive lines, okay? Oh, man, we have a lot to talk about on this episode of Locked on Canes. I don't know why. Siri, Siri, stop setting off this alarm. I'm trying to have a conversation here with the Locked on Canes everydayers. We have a lot coming up on this episode. Um, I have watched, as many of you guys have, really cool interview with Chikari Brown on the Momentum podcast. He spoke for an hour and 15 minutes about... Uh, you know, his his loyalty to Miami, his experiences at the U, the rest of the quarterback room. He shared his thoughts on Cam Ward coming in. Jakari explained in his words why he wanted to redshirt this past year. Um, my big takeaways from that, we'll talk more about it. This young man has an unbelievable attitude. You should know that already, but Jakari, extremely positive guy. He's a competitor. And man, I thought that he hit that interview out of the park. I want to talk about that a little bit more on the other side. And man, I want to answer some of you guys' questions. We have some good questions about uh, in the era of NIL, are walk-ons really walk-ons anymore? If you can offset the scholarship costs with NIL money, uh, I want to talk about that and so much more. My friends, you want to keep it locked right here. We're only getting started on this episode of Locked on Canes. And you know we're only getting started on FanDuel. Guys, I know the NFL season is marching towards the finish line. You've got conference championship games. Still have the Super Bowl coming up. There's so much going on in the NBA, college basketball. Guys, there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use. There are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab, 
You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub. That's the best way to find popular parlays. I mean, in any given day, you could have an NFL selection and a European soccer selection and an NBA selection in the same day. It just makes it so much fun. There's so many options at FanDuel. I love the player props as well. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make that first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen and your first watch today. By the way, for the everydayers, you can take your everydayer experience to the next level by joining our exclusive SMS texting service called Locked on Canes Insiders. I include the link in the show description below. On Locked on Canes Insiders, we're going to answer some of you guys' questions on this episode today. On Locked on Canes Insiders, you get text messages directly from my phone to yours, one-on-one Q&As, breaking news, recruiting scoops, transfer portal, transfer portal, easy for me to say, transfer portal scoops. It is all there. Try it free for 14 days by clicking the link in the show description below. If you like it, you can opt in for $4.99 a month. We try to give you a lot of added value on there. So, wow, I was watching a really good uh, interview. I'm going to link it in the show description below. Jakari Brown on the Momentum podcast. Um, He explained something we've talked about on Locked on Canes, but I was happy to hear it in his own words, not from like secondhand information about why he asked to redshirt last year, because he did ask to redshirt. He wanted that. He wanted to play on the scout team because Jakari thought probably correctly he could, you know, to take that red shirt year, he could develop more and actually play more in practice if he was on the scout team because, you know, had he not red shirted last year, he he would have been the package guy again. Like this is the short yardage or run the football package guy. And he thought that being that guy again could set him back in terms of his development and his NFL future. He's probably right about that. The way he explained it made a lot of sense that Jakari really wanted to take last year to focus on his overall development as a quarterback and get better, right? He even mentioned in the pod, like, he knows he's not perfect. Uh, He believes in himself. He believes in his abilities. But, you know, he's still working on his passing accuracy and all that stuff, and he admitted that. But he wanted to take last year to really focus on that and try to get better in all of that stuff. And listen, I, uh, I thought you know we only we only saw him in one game this past year, and I know Miami lost in the pinstripe bowl against Rutgers, but overall, I was pretty pleased with the development and the improvement that Jakari Brown showed us in that game. So uh, he wants to keep going onwards and upwards with that. He did speak about Cam Ward and the competition. He had nice things to say about Reese Poffenberger, nice things to say about Cam Ward. And listen, he talked about the business aspect of football. He understands like he didn't take when Mario Cristobal brought Cam Ward in through the transfer portal. Jakari didn't take that as a slight. He didn't take that as Mario Cristobal dissing him or anything like that. He understands that Cristobal has a job to do, and that's to assemble the best possible talent, because if the team doesn't win, eventually the coach gets fired. That's just what happens in college football. So he understands why Mario Cristobal did that. And he seems to have a positive attitude about it, you know, trying to compete for whatever playing time there is to be had this year, 2024, and the opportunity to to win that starting job outright in 2025. He thinks that is there for him. Uh, I love some of the stories that Jakari shared about Emery Williams, who, you know, he described as one of his best friends. Uh, and it it seems like, by the way, Jakari sounds like a great guy. And I've had a few conversations with Emery. Emery seems like a fantastic young man as well. You know, Jakari talked about how, you know, Emery is is very religious and like very wise with that stuff. And a lot of times Jakari would kind of lean on Emery for some, you know, religious advice and and positivity, which seems really cool, the relationship that they have. And, you know, Brown, he thinks Miami, they're taking positive steps, right? He understands they're not in the position right now that the Georgias of the world are in. I know George, like Georgia wasn't even in the college football playoff, but yeah, I still look at them as the gold standard in college football based on what they did the previous two years and, you know, what they did to Florida State in that bowl game. Like he understands Miami's not where Georgia is right now, but that Mario Cristobal, who's, you know, been part of winning cultures like at Alabama and what he was able to build at Oregon and the Cristobal is trying to bring Miami to that sort of a spot. So I thought that was tremendous. You know, I've, I have had some opportunities in the last couple of years to speak with Jakari Brown. I've always thought he's a tremendous young man. This is why we root for Jakari on this show, but I came away from 
watching that interview, liking him even more than I thought. And I, I love the way he embraces competition because the attitude that he has and he talked, you know, he talked about NIL and stuff, but for him, it's more, you know, it's more about developing for the future, for the NFL money than it is for the NIL. It's more about the NFL than the NIL, if I can coin that phrase for him. Uh, an interesting nugget was dropped yesterday by Caneville on social media. Uh, they said, update. The situation involving Jacoby George has been found to be less serious than initially reported. He says, uh, Caneville said, we're pleased to inform that George is in good spirits and has resumed training with the team. Uh, so, yeah, you guys remember it was a couple weeks ago. This actually happened again. Everything always happens when Donna was on vacation. This happened while I was on my cruise. Uh, he was charged, I think, with a couple misdemeanors related to what was described as street racing. Um, so again, I, I don't know what any of this is going to mean if, for the fall. I don't know if there's going to be any sort of a, a team suspension for him, but it, it sounds like, you know, if I take that report, it sounds like whatever the legal ramifications are, are going to be much less serious than some people assume they were going to be. And I hope that's true because a, I want Jacoby George to, uh, you know, to figure out some of the emotional stuff and off the field stuff. Cause he's a tremendous football player. You know, he's may maybe got to mature a little bit is, you know, I think there was evidence to that and all those personal fouls he picked up in the Rutgers game. But, you know, I, I want this dude to be able to zone in and just reach his potential because I think he can be a tremendous football player. I mean, scored eight touchdowns last year, put up big numbers uh, compared to other ACC receivers. So hopefully, hopefully Jacoby George can get through this and learn from it. Those are the most important things. All right, I want to answer some of you guys' questions here. Uh, again, you can join our Locked on Canes Insiders chat. Click the link in the show description below. Try it free for 14 days. We get a question from Joseph who says, this is a great question because a lot of people are talking about this stuff now. He says, hey, Dono, now with NIL, do you foresee the scholarship limit not being a big deal? Teams can get past the scholarship limit with walk-ons, and as long as they're getting enough NIL money, they can pay for their own tuition, he says. Uh, Joseph, this is a tremendous question. I've done a little research on this, and I've asked some folks about how this goes, like people who are familiar with the college circles. So I'm going to give you my best possible answer because I've thought about this as well, right? You've got this 85 scholarship limit where, you know, if you're not on scholarship, you have to pay your own tuition. So what's to stop football programs from saying, hey, 85 scholarships, ha, huh, that's not enough for us. Let's bring in some extra really good players and just pay them a ton of NIL money. So even though they're not on scholarship, they're still making money out of this, okay? I've wondered this myself because it does seem like something that could become a slippery slope, okay? But here's the issue. Building a roster that way, adding scholarship caliber players as basically pseudo walk-ons, it would be incredibly expensive, <laughs> OK, like to a point where even some of these like oil money NIL donors around the country, like th this may seem like a step too far on a regular basis. I'm not saying it hasn't happened maybe here and there with a few players, but to actually do this on the regular terrible investment because, OK, folks, the average tuition at a state university it can be in the $25,000 range if you're from outside that state, which is the case for a lot of football players, obviously. So. You're talking about NIL donors at an average state university would have to pay 25K in NIL plus extra money to, you know, make them turn a profit as well. And if you're talking about Miami, you're talking about way over 25K. I think the average tuition at Miami, uh, and this even sounds kind of low, but I, I, I looked this up on, online. The average tuition is over 57,000 per year. So, you know. You're talking about, you know, if you're, oh, we really want this guy as a walk on. So we're going to have to pay 57K per year just for the tuition. And then if he actually wants NIL money, so he's turning a profit the way the scholarship guys are, you've got to pay more money on top of that. Uh, so it, it seems a little absurd. OK, it seems like a really bad investment for NIL donors. Plus, here's the other part of it, guys. Do you really need much more than 85 scholarship caliber players on a roster? It seems like this problem would fix itself in the long run. It's only 22 starting jobs available, and there's only one football. So if you're a blue chip guy and you go to play for a place like uh, like Georgia, for example, and you're a walk-on who's making a big NIL deal, 
Well, chances are if if they're bringing on like five, 10 walk-ons on big NIL deals and there's 85 guys on scholarship, you're not going to play very much and you're going to end up transferring out anyway. OK, so uh, again, I don't know. You know, it, uh, I'm not going to be naive enough to think that things like this aren't actually happening or that they could happen somewhere. I'm just telling you, I don't think this is going to become some plague like some of you expect it would be. Uh, and, you know, in, in terms of the NCAA regulating this, I don't know how they can really do that because it's definitely a gray area, but they have taken steps in the past against roster manipulation. Um, so, for example, you're no longer allowed to bring in a football player with a track scholarship the way that Butch Davis did with Santana Moss. And, you know, honestly, but that brings up another point, though. If you're thinking about, you know, roster manipulation, probably would be more likely to happen on, you know, Florida State just had a scholarship reduction, a small one. Like they have to surrender five scholarships over the course of two years for the NIL problem that they had. Uh, Michigan, Michigan might end up in bigger trouble once they finish up the Connor Stallions investigation. So maybe there, like maybe that's where you could have the issue if you punish teams with scholarship reductions, then maybe then they'll try to supplement to get to, you know, 85 with some walk on manipulation. But I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But again, Florida State, they're only losing five scholarships over the course of two years. So I don't know if they're going to have to really do something like that, but we'll see how this plays out. But I thought that was an excellent, excellent question. And I appreciate you, uh, you know, asking the question forced me to do a little research on that. Um, we got questions about possible transfers. Uh, Miami's still going after wide receivers. What about the offensive linemen from Washington? Folks, we're not done yet. We're only getting started. You want to keep it locked right here to Locked on Canes. And thanks for making us your first listen and first watch today. By the way, I hope you're checking out Locked on Sports today. The Locked On Network has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming YouTube channel. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus national shows that cover every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming YouTube channel. All right, we get another question from our Locked On Canes Insiders group from Stephen C., who says, Hey, have you heard anything about more potential wide receiver transfers coming in? Uh, yeah, so obviously, Stephen, we we've missed on. I mean, I, I'm going to use the word "missed" in air quotes, like because again, I don't I don't know which guys Miami has pushed harder for, but there have obviously been some top receivers in the portal who have already landed elsewhere. So seemingly, we've missed on some guys. But I know someone Miami is interested in is six foot five junior college wide receiver Leland Smith. Super athletic, runs a 4-4-1, 40-yard dash. Leland Smith is, he's scheduled to visit this weekend. Um, and actually, if you watch that Jakari Brown interview that I referenced earlier, Jakari even said during the interview, I think we might add another one when talking about wide receivers. So he, he knows Miami is out there searching around. So in terms of Leland Smith, um, he is because when, when you come out of Juco, like they, they kind of treat it like a, like a high school player in terms of recruitment. So National Signing Day, the, the late National Signing Day, February 7th, I think that would be a day to watch for. We'll see if the Smith visit goes really well. His official visit coming up this weekend. If that does go well, we're going to have our eyes on National Signing Day, February 7th as a possible date to land another receiver. And I think this is absolutely a guy who could help the team. And I think you could create a, a really nice battle there between Isaiah Horton and Leland Smith. If, if Smith were to arrive, those guys would battle it out to be the uh, Colby Young replacement now that Colby Young has gone on to play at Georgia. Get a question from ND Hater 85 uh, Actually, he says, I don't even have a question, he says, but I need a favor. He says, can you tell Hoodie Girl I will be at the Notre Dame Miami game tonight right behind the bench rooting for our Canes men's team? Uh, I know Hoodie Girl listens to the show, so consider consider Hoodie Girl to be alerted, ND hater. And I love the fact that this dude, he lives in ND country, in Notre Dame country, and he goes to Notre Dame games to root for Miami when Miami's in town. God bless you. You are fantastic. And ND hater, I know Hoodie Girl's going to be watching the game tonight, as am I. I will be watching for you, and I'm going to know when I see like a, 
a, a crazy Miami fan sitting behind the basket. I'm going to know exactly who I'm looking at. So thank you. We get a question from Nick C who says, Hey, top flight cornerback continues to be a swing and a miss in recruiting. While they did a very good job with the rest of the DB room, we continue to miss out on that corner that can neutralize the other team's number one wide receiver. Help doesn't seem to be coming from incoming freshmen or the portal. We have aspirations for this year with the quarterback room being seemingly fixed. What impact does this have on this year? Class of 2025, he says, is irrelevant, I guess, for his argument. Um, well, first of all, I I think you might be downplaying Damari Brown a little bit. Uh, Damari, when he got some playing time later in the year as a true freshman, and this guy, this guy, an absolute stud coming out of high school at American Heritage, which is arguably the best program in the country, high school, when it comes to developing defensive backs. And Damari, I thought, for example, did about as good of a job as you could possibly do on Keon Coleman against Florida State. I know Coleman did score a, a touchdown on him, and a lot of Florida State fans posted that highlight like, aha, he cooked Damari. Damari had him in his back pocket for most of that game. So do not sleep on Damari Brown. Yeah, in terms of guys Miami has missed out on, obviously, you know, the big puzzling one last year was Cormani McLean. I'm not even sure how good Cormani is because – between the years seems to be an issue for him. Um, and, you know, you missed out. Uh, I mean, missed out. You had an opportunity maybe to flip Ellis Robinson, and that didn't end up happening. Uh, so, you know, I think I think those are the misses you're talking about. But don't sleep on Damari Brown. Uh, you know, you know, we could talk about the 2024s, although, you know, those guys, I don't know how much impact they're going to have the first year. Don't sleep on Robert Stafford either. You know, didn't really get on the field last year, but my understanding is he was probably dealing with like more injuries or, or minor injuries than people realize. So, uh, and Stafford, I loved him coming out of high school. So, um, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't downplay Miami's cornerback room too much. Plus we've already seen it and we've seen it in his previous stops, but we've already seen it in, in two seasons that Jamil Adai, uh, Miami's, uh, defensive backs coach who obviously focuses a lot on the corners. He does a really good job with player development, right? I mean, you know, he, not only got a couple guys drafted last year from the cornerback room who both had good NFL seasons. He's about to get two safeties drafted highly this year. So at least from a development standpoint, Miami has a DB's coach that has proven he can do that. We get a question from Terry in Tennessee who says, hey, what do you think about the scenario of Miami hiring Ken Dorsey for quarterbacks coach? We have to start developing our own guys and some consistency would do worlds of good, he says. Dorsey could also be in place for the OC quarterback's coach job whenever Dawson moves on. Well, the first part of this is um, I can't assume this is something that Dorsey wants right now. I mean, I, I know that, uh, you know, he's I, I guess he's still he's still sitting around without a job after being fired midseason as the OC in Buffalo. But I've known this for years on Dorsey. He loves coaching in the NFL, and that's you know setback losing that gig in Buffalo. But I think he's still kind of waiting around to see how the NFL coaching carousel goes. If he can pick up another job there, uh, so obviously Dorsey loves Miami. He loves the U. He's one of the great all-time players to ever put on that helmet. But I, I can't assume that this is something that he wants. I don't know if that's the case. Okay, actually, I could see something as being more likely. If Dorsey, if Dorsey were to decide that maybe this NFL coaching cycle is not the one for him to get his best opportunity, he can either take a year off and let that cycle spin for another year, or maybe he does something that a lot of coaches do these days is, and think about taking an analyst job at a university. So honestly, like I, I'm not, I don't really have any reason to believe that Dorsey would come here to be the quarterback's coach, but. I don't know. Maybe it's not out of the realm of possibility he could take an analyst job. The other thing about Miami is um, you couldn't just hire a quarterback's coach without removing another assistant coach because Miami's at the max, right? Uh, they're not at the max with analysts, but they're at the max with official assistant coaches. So there's a reason why your offensive coordinator is also your quarterback's coach because you needed to fill those two spots with one guy because you don't have any other spots available. So you would have to have another one of your assistant coaches would have to leave if you were to make Dorsey your uh, your quarterback's coach. So um, that's a very long-winded way of saying I'm not expecting anything to happen there, but I hope I'm wrong because I love me some Dorsey. I really do. We got some questions from uh, Salty Warrior. 
who says, hey, which position groups are overloaded at this point at Miami? Uh, I mean, overload, I mean, you, I, I, I guess you could say, you could say running back. Um, there's a lot of bodies there. You know, you just added, uh, you just added Rodney Hill as a walk-on and you've got a lot there. Uh, hopefully Trevante Citizen can bounce back and be healthy this season. Uh, your quarterback room is pretty loaded now. The thing is, I don't, I don't know if I would say anything is overloaded. Got a lot of edge rushers, but this day and age, I'm not going to say overloaded. I, I'd say bring in as much depth and as much competition as possible. All right, my friends, thank you so much for making this episode of Locked on Canes your first listen today. We're free wherever you get your podcasts. We're free on YouTube. Uh, make sure if you're watching us on YouTube, smash that like button. Hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe. If you listen to the audio version, fantastic. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey app, wherever you get your podcasts, make sure to subscribe and leave us a five-star rating and review. And we will talk to you again next time on another episode of Locked on Canes. We're part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.